to order the school board of education meeting, the Scarborough School Board of Education meeting. It is Thursday, November 16th, 2017, 7 p.m. Attendance? Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mrs. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Kazlonis? Here. Mrs. Lightford? Here. Ms. Perry? Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Starr? Here. Mr. Hilton? Here. And Mr. Bashan? Here. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There are no uh, adjustments to the 4.0 adjustments to the agenda. There are none tonight, but I did want to read um, some thank yous. Uh, as many of you know, we just uh, finished our NEASC accreditation visit, so we wanted to first um, thank all of the Scarborough High School leadership, um, the school board, the teachers who all attended. We had the kickoff welcome reception on Sunday, November 5th, um, and then the high school went through three and a half days of rigorous um, peer review with the um, the visiting committee. There were 15 members on the visiting committee um, and the high school really left no detail left unturned in terms of preparing for the visit and organizing a visit that was well um, structured and flowed really well. The committee had nothing but positive things to say and one of the things the Scarborough High School um, did to welcome them to our community was create um, welcome bags and several of our businesses in town or several businesses in the area donated so um, we wanted to thank them publicly tonight um, for their support and the pro and their generous donation so it was Robert Hateman from Hannaford this company donated Portland magazines high-end and very sturdy recyclable totes chocolates caramels hard candies chips mints power bars and more. Um, they were the largest contributor by far. And when the NEAS committee is here, they're in the schools all day and then they are writing the report um, and analyzing all the data that they collect through the evening, so lots of snacks are good. Um, Zachary Mullen from Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts gave us gift cards so our visitors could get a much needed cup of coffee between the hotel and the high school. Stonewell Kitchen, Fiona Brooks. Um, Stonewall Kitchen donated Maine blueberry jam and Maine mustard as a gift for our visitors. Ed Buckley from Shaw's. Shaw's gave us reusable grocery bags and a gift card to buy fruit for the visitors. And Holy Donut, uh, Lee Kellis, uh, Elizabeth and Jeff Buckwalter, uh, they, uh, although they're a brand new business to Scarborough, they were very generous in giving us gift cards to include in the welcome packets. We thought it was great to be able to share a new business with our visitors. So thank you again to all of our um, contributing partners for that really nice welcome bag. The other um, just quick announcement is a schedule change for our school board meeting. Our December 7th meeting has been moved to November 30th. So there will only be one meeting in December, and that'll be December 21st, um, and that's due to some um, technological improvements that are happening to here in Chambers A. 5.0 is public comments on agenda. Would anyone from the public like to speak about the agenda? No? All right, seeing none. 6.0, new business. 6.1 is the election of the chair of the Board of Education. So as you know, Kelly Murphy has left us, but I heard she's home watching. Hi, Kelly. Um, <laughs> so we're looking for a nomination for the new school board chair. I would like to nominate Donna Bailey. Second. Dr. Roll call. Are, just, are there any other nominations? Any other nominations? Okay. Any comments? Any comments about that? I think she's going to do a wonderful job. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All in favor of Donna becoming the new school board chair? Six, seven, plus two? Okay. So we'll do a switching of the seats, and then I can stop sweating for having to lead the meeting, and Donna can take over. Okay. 
You might want to change the name tag. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good eye, Dylan. <laughs> and before going on to 6.2, I just want to remind you all that um, we'll need to select our committees during the next two weeks. So um, I've got some information to hand out for you to just take a look at a little bit more in-depth information on the various committees. Those who are already on committees, if you want to change something, then let me know. And if you want to add an additional committee to what you're already doing, that would be wonderful. But um, there's the list and a little bit more in-depth information for our two new board members. Thank you. And 6.2, election of the vice chair. Are there nominations for the position of vice chair on the Board of Education? Uh, yes, I, I nominate Jody Shea. Jody Shea, is there a second. a second? Very good. Any discussion? Any other nominations? Very good. All in favor of electing Jody Shea, Vice Chair? Very good, thank you. 6.3, a donation from the Paquettes to the Backpack Program. Do you wanna be able to speak on that? Hi, uh, yes, I have an email on that. So we um, were fortunate enough this week to receive a donation um, from the pet Paquettes. They're great, generous supporters of our district initiatives. And um, tonight the board would have to accept a $1,000 donation from Heather and Brian Paquette to the backpack program. Because Brian is a Unum employee, he will also be getting a matching grant from Unum. So I think that um, I also would just like the board to know that Brian and Heather have consistently donated to the backpack program over the years, as well as making a donation to Eight Corners last year for a special project um, toward alternative seating for students. So um, we're grateful for their uh, support and wanted to thank them and give the board the opportunity to accept the donation. Okay. Any questions about that or any comments anyone wants to make? Just thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much. We can use everything we can get right now. So, all in favor of accepting that contribution? Very good, unanimous. Seven point oh, we're entering our workshop at this time. Seven point one, the long term facility planning. Julie, you want to do an introduction? On that? I do, and before um, I do introduce our guests tonight for this workshop agenda item, I just wanted to welcome our two new board members, Hillary and Leanne. We're uh, really excited to have you join us and want to look forward to learning and working alongside you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome. Um, so at this time, I would ask Deanne Cecil from Harriman and Lisa Sawin to come up to the podium. Uh, we have been working on long-range facility planning since uh, well before I arrived and consistently since I arrived. So um, I've had the pleasure of working with both Deanne and Lisa um, a lot over the last several months that I've been here. And um, one of the things that we are looking to do, if you remember back in January of 2017, Dan and Lisa were here um, talking with us about several different options. I think at that time we were looking at A through F in terms of various options while also uh, can, you know, monitoring our enrollment projections, looking at how uh, we're faring in those projections based on our current enrollment and always trying to think forward so that we're as proactive as we can around our facility needs. Um, Last week we had, Dan's going to go over the timeline so I won't go into too many details, but last week we did have our DOE, our first round of DOE site visits. So if you remember back in April 2017, um, Todd led us in applying for, um, we submitted actually four rating cycle applications, one for the middle school um, and one for each of our K2s. And in that process, just to remind you, we are only identifying the challenges that we face with our facilities in terms of uh, safety, programming, um, uh, 
efficiencies, um, all of those things, both on the interior and the exterior of the building. And Todd um, put a lot of hours into working directly with the principals to understand the programmatic needs. And each application is literally, you know, a big thick binder that Todd drove up to Augusta himself and hand delivered. So we thank him for his <laughs> leadership and commitment in that work. And then we've been waiting for the DOE to come so we can talk with them about our schools. And um, the way it worked last week, we went to the middle school in eight corners and we spent um, a significant amount of time answering their questions trying to stay in order without interrupting um, to share all of our <laughs> ideas and needs and then we did a walk through the building and they really looked um, in every <coughs> kind of nook and cranny that you would expect them to both inside the building the boiler rooms um, the, the maintenance rooms and things that you know most people don't go in when they come in to see a school checking out the classrooms and program limitations and then also the exterior of the facilities. After that, we went to um, Eight Corners and did the same thing there. And then they'll be back tomorrow to finish our other two visits, which will start at Pleasant Hill tomorrow at 9, spend about three hours there, and then head over to Blue Point and spend about three hours there. So if uh, currently there are 77 schools on the list, and I keep saying that we are on the bottom of the list, but that's only because it's in alphabetical order. <laughs> um, so we are hopeful that they will see the needs that we have in our schools the way that we see the needs. Um, a couple things that are interesting is that obviously they're trying to be as consistent as they can, being they being the DOE, um, as they travel around Maine and look at all of the cha facility challenges that schools on the or districts on the list are facing. And they're using, if you remember, our enrollment projections have two numbers. There's the best fit number and there's the new housing number. Um, and last year, at the end of year, we were outpacing the best fit number by 77 students and the new housing model by 14 students. So although, yes, it is true, our enrollment is lower than it was just a few years ago, um, we are outpacing projections currently. So one of the things we're trying to understand is, well, what's, what was actually included in terms of development in our community at the time that those projections were done? Um, and so I'm trying to get to the bottom of that and understand that. And we have the opportunity to submit um, some unforeseen or um, unknown circumstances to the DOE as part of our application until December 31st of this year. So we plan to add a letter noting that um, this year. They did say at our last visit that they were um, considering using, although they're using the best fit number across the state and they're trying to be as consistent as possible, they are considering using the new housing model number in Scarborough because it is much more accurate than the other. So I thought that was um, hope that left me feeling hopeful. Um, and I think the uh, one of the other things that's important for the community to know is they're only looking five years out. Usually they look 10 years out, but they've decided to just look five years out. So I plan to talk a bit more <laughs> with them about that tomorrow, because if you look at our enrollment projections, exactly five years out is when as a district we're at one of our lower points and the very next year we start to increase our enrollment again. So we want them to really understand that um, and it may be worth our time to try to update our enrollment projections with um, someone who's able to do that study. Planning decisions um, I don't believe is still together as they were, but we happen to know someone who authored the study who works in our district that may be able to offer us supporter gu support guidance. So that's kind of like the big update, setting the stage for why we're starting to look at some of the options that Dan is going to share with you tonight. The other thing that's different from January when we talked last with Dan and Lisa, in January we were talking just K-12 and now um, with what we've learned in the last few months um, from the DOE, we're thinking about what if pre-K were to come sooner than we thought it may? Um, what impact might that have on our schools? Hmm. So with that, okay. I turn it over to Dan. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be here again. And uh, I also, we also welcome the board and the new board members here. It, uh, it's an interesting process that we've gone through the last four years, and it'll continue to be interesting to try to match your facilities with your programs and with your growth and population. And uh, we have a lot of information to share with you tonight, so we'd like to walk through 
our presentation, and then we'll take questions for as long as you'd like. Uh, I want to point out that my colleague Lisa is a Scarborough resident and has two wee burns at home right now uh, watching mom, I'm sure, and uh, so we can all wave to the, her, her kids when, uh, when the opportunity presents itself. So Lisa's going to do the first half of the presentation, and then I'll do the second half, and then we'll open it up for questions uh, for as long as, uh, as you'd like. And if anybody doesn't have a handout, we have many of them here, so uh, do, you have a, do you have a handout? Okay, great. Um, we have extras if anybody needs them because it'll be easier to follow from the handout, I think, than the projection on the, on the wall. So I'll give it over to Lisa Saltwin. Thank you, Dan. Hello, everyone, um, my fellow residents. Um, let's see. So we're going to start with why are we here today? So it's been touched on already. Um, one of the big reasons we're here is <clears throat> Since we did the in initial study back in 2013, we're revisiting the population projections. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are showing an increase in student population that will greatly impact the educational environment of our students if nothing is done. Um, and we'll, we'll get into more detail as to what that might look like. In order to make sure that our buildings are as energy efficient and effective, we need to start the conversation today. I know 2025 sounds like a long way away. It's less than eight years away, um, but if we make a decision today on what we're doing, the process could take anywhere from four to five years before you occupy the building. So that's a, it's a long process, um, so the sooner we start that conversation, the more due diligence we can do and arrive at the best solution. Um, <clears throat> It also impacts, the decision that's made impacts capital improvement projects. So whatever, whatever plan that we go forward with, the sooner we know what that's going to be, um, Todd can dial in what projects he needs to tackle now or which projects might be able to be solved with that problem. Um, and as always, we, just like all of you, pride ourselves on being good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. So the sooner we can start planning and being proactive, the better stewards we can be. So the goals uh, for, for the revisit of the study uh, were to analyze the impact on the permanent facilities with the population growth, look at right-sizing the educational spaces to DOE standards where feasible, eliminate modular classrooms. Um, we, anyone who's been in one knows how, how just not nice they are as a learning environment. The acoustics, the air quality, just there's nothing great about a portable. So if we can eliminate those portables, uh, it, everybody, everybody benefits. Um, study feasibility and impact of using, uh, of using portables on site. So we'll look at an option as to what, what might happen um, if, if we do nothing and, and that's the solution. Analyze operation and maintenance costs for expanded facilities. Julie already talked about bringing in the pre-K program, so looking at bringing in, bringing in 150 pre-K students by 2025. Um, and then looking at the existing primary schools and can they accommodate the expansions that are required for our program needs today and in 2025. Study if a consolidated primary school would be more cost effective than three small schools, and then plan for future growth beyond 2025. <coughs> so making sure that expandability is, is possible. <coughs> How did we go about this? Um, we analyzed the, the population projections. Uh, we started gra gathering um, operation and maintenance uh, information so we could see um, how much is being spent at, at each school, both from an operations standpoint but also from a, from a staffing standpoint. Uh, we held meetings with the administrators. We met with each principal of the primary schools and really listened to what what is the school, what are the spaces in your school now? How are they being used? How many teachers are using that same space? How is it programmed? Where are the deficits? And then when we look at adding students to your school, how many spaces will be needed in order to, to do that correctly? Um, we, from there, created programs. So list of rooms um, that would be needed and, and staff that would be needed. Uh, we've generated, it says seven here, but technically eight options um, if you consider the option of not doing anything and really looking at what the impact of that might be, um, of, of really looking at how do we right-size all of the schools from, from pre-K through 12. 
Um, you'll see that we have options A through, I think it's G or, or A, H. I'm starting to lose track of how many options we have. Um, and we took two of those options, B and F, and really analyzed those in more detail, um, really looking at the least consolidated to the most consolidated so we could really see what the difference was. Uh, we developed develop site plans and floor plans and preliminary costs for those options and compared uh, the cost of building and operating those options in today's dollars. So the enrollment projections. Um, if you've ever seen an enrollment projection study, it's about 20 pages long and has a ton of graphs and a ton of information. We tried to just break it down as simply as possible. So the top three bars are the primary schools, the, the red bars. You have Blue Point at the top, you have Eight Corners and Pleasant Hill. Um, if you look across the board from today to 2025, including pre-K, collectively, you have an increase of 302 students just at the primary schools. Um, if you look at uh, Wentworth, um, the middle school and the high school, you actually have a, a decline in high school students, um, which overall, when you, when you add it all up, you have about 301 students added to the district or to the department, but the majority of those are in, in the, pre, in the uh, primary school. But that bubble is just going to go through the school, so we really have to make sure that all the schools are correctly sized. And as Julie mentioned, you are currently outpacing these projections. So what if we do nothing? Um, what if we don't right-size the programs? Or, sorry, the schools. Um, this graphic shows uh, each one of the schools. The big square is your permanent building. Each small square are the portables that are currently at those schools. Blue Point has four. Eight Corners has six. Pleasant Hill has two. And that might surprise some people because you guys have done a great job of disguising them so they look like part of the building but they are portables and they're uh, they're definitely different space educational there's a different quality to the educational space than the permanent building and then you have 12 at the middle school so if you were to not do anything not only with the core spaces and when we say core spaces that's like uh, cafeteria gymnasium uh, library where all the students gather at, at once not only will those be undersized but you will add additional portables to the schools. We will add three at Blue Point, six at Eight Corners, and six at Pleasant Hill. So just to go back for a minute, you had 24, you're going to go up to about 39, plus or minus. This all depends on, on where maybe the pre-K students are and if you need additional classrooms depending on, on where the, the number of students are. We're looking at an increase of 15 portables, um, and that's, they're, they're just happening at the primary grades. You already have 12 at the middle school. So to look at it another way, by 2025, 45% of the pre-K classrooms will be in portables if you do nothing. Pre-K to two. Currently, 18% of the sixth through eighth grade classrooms are in portables. By 2025, 19% of your pre-K through 12th grade classrooms will be in portables. 69% of those are in the primary grades pre-K through two. So pre-K, the economics of investing in early childhood. And Julie, I'm going to turn this over to you for just a second to, to speak about just the, the importance of investing uh, in, in our pre-K students. And that just happens to be my pre-K student right there. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, I think that what I, the biggest takeaway when you think about early childhood education is return on investment. And so we know that there's been a lot of studies done, um, and the research is really crystal clear that when we invest early, the gains that we yield, um, not only for our students, obviously the gains that they yield are massive, but for us um, in terms of uh, financial gains are, are pretty dramatic. And so in some of the recent studies that have been done, um, we've learned that pretty much for every dollar, there's a, an $8.60 return on your investment over the time that that child is on, in school. So every dollar we spend on pre-K, we get an $8.60 roughly return on investment. We also know that um, we're in the midst of an opioid crisis, and we would be naive not to be thinking about that as we plan for our future. Um, 
more and more babies are being born drug addicted in Maine and we know that those students need early intervention. They typically need services right at birth and all the way up through their education so we want to be able to um, be, support those students as early as possible. Um, and just a little bit of understanding of what's causing us to be thinking about pre-K in Scarborough at this time, um, the Department have, of Education has um, been studying CDS services, which is Child Development Services, which are offered to children who have developmental delays from ages zero or birth to five. Um, and what they've learned is that students are really grossly underserved. Um, there's many children who are not getting any services at all, or um, if they are, they're not getting them consistently. So although we are investing as a state in early intervention, we're not seeing that return on investment because it's not consistently done. And the Department of Education believes that public schools have the infrastructure um, to better serve those students, I believe that as well, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions um, and the Department of Ed is currently <coughs> studying the <coughs> impacts of shifting that responsibility to the schools um, as we speak. And so their initial timeline was very aggressive. They had planned to study this year and then requiring some um, regions in Maine to take on that responsibility as soon as July 1, 2018, um, and then the remaining regions in uh, July one 2019 so it's happening much quicker than we even anticipated that's not a firm timeline at this point um, but we want to be thinking about what could that look like um, and how do we plan for it moving forward if we watch our neighbors in Massachusetts at all the leaders in uh, public education in, in our country that last year in Boston alone they um, offered free pre-k for all students in the city and so the reason why they're making those types of investments is is this return on investment that you see here we know that waiting to intervene um, costs way more money almost three times as much um, if we wait until a child's in kindergarten before we intervene thank you oh and I would also add we're using the number 150 for our projected enrollment because currently in Scarborough we know of about 74 75 students who are ages 3 4 and 5 that are that are scheduled to receive CDS services or child development services and if we were going to house a pre-k program in our district we would want to have at least 51 percent of the population be typically developing and 49 percent of the population to um, be needing that early intervention and so that's where we came up with the 150 also recognizing that we have um, some really great early childhood centers in Scarborough and some families would still want to have that as an option um, or may choose to keep their children home during those early years so the number is much lower than our projected K numbers thank you Julie yep. <clears throat> So to revisit the impacts or emphasize the impacts of doing nothing, um, you would end up with massive overcrowding, inadequate program space, safety and security issues, um, for example, parking, think about the increase of, of parents and dropping off and just how crowded things are now at the primary schools and, and any of the schools for that matter, um, energy inefficiency, um, right now we'll show you a, a chart in a little bit about the, how all the buildings are performing and, and where, um, where the primary schools are, are falling in that chart. Food service inefficiency, undersized building systems, um, and phys fiscally irresponsible. Um, so when we talk about undersized core spaces, when we're talking about the, the portable graphic, just to really paint the picture of what, what that's gonna look like. So you have a, uh, we, we call them gymatoriums or cafetoriums. People have different, different terms for them. We have gym and cafeteria in the same space. With how the schools would be loaded and you don't increase those core spaces, the gym cafeteria will be utilized by one to two gym classes all day, every day. That means the students cannot get access to the cafeteria during lunch. They will be eating lunch in their classrooms and or have reduced physical education as a result. And all of these things that Lisa's pointing out now are highlights in our applications with the DOE. So we're having these same conversations and these are the things that we're pointing out to them as we walk through our facilities. So through the, um, 
through this presentation, we're going to show you an option, um, and, and there's there's several options, but we, we've chosen uh, one one to highlight tonight that will show you how to make Scarborough schools future ready. And this example on day one will offset the $4 million in debt service just by the reduction in personnel cost alone. Overall, this option in today's dollars will save just south of $2 million in total project costs um, in comparison to uh, right-sizing um, uh, the primary schools, which we'll get into in a minute. It will save $3.3 million in bonding costs over 30 years, and as mentioned before, $4.2 million in personnel costs. So what does the schedule look like? We, we started talking about the four, four to five years. So the history has been that we've been working with Scarborough since 2013 to develop the facilities master plan. Um, at, at that time, I believe actually the enrollment was declining and now, now it is increasing. Um, as part of that, our recommendation was uh, to pursue DOE funding, and that's what you guys are doing now. You, uh, I know Julie and Todd met with the DOE, Scott Brown um, heads up that department in January of 2017. In April, the uh, funding applications were submitted. And last week they had their first visit and this week they're having their second visit as Julie indicated. That funding list, um, we can't give you an exact date, we wish we could, <laughs> uh, is going to come out somewhere in the fall, summer to fall of 2018 is when we'll find out where the schools rank on that list. Um, so uh, again, if we, um, the, the schedule for, for uh, a building, um, it takes about a year of design and studies to get to referendum. So even before it gets on the ballot, there's about a year plus or minus that's needed to pretty much come up with a design and a cost before we take it uh, and put it on the ballot. Um, from there, it's 10 plus or minus months um, after referendum to put the, the documents out on the street for bidding. The construction period will go anywhere from about two plus or minus years. Um, and so it's going to be four, four or so years until the building's occupied. But keep in mind, if it's a DOE funded project, that typically adds another year to the process. Um, they have a very prescriptive process that has to go through, and we have to align with their funding mechanisms and, and count, uh, um, formulas. So as part, of, as part of this study, as we started to look at, at these different options, um, one of the first things we look at are how are the existing buildings performing? And this is actually a, a graph that was in the original um, uh, study that we did, and we've updated the uh, figure since then. Um, I don't know how well you can see it, but right, these top three numbers are the primary schools. And the next one is Wentworth, and then the next one below that is the middle school. Now, just looking at the numbers, um, it's, it's clear that Wentworth and, and the high school are two of the better performers. Um, but keep in mind, Wentworth and the middle school are fully air conditioned. So that sets those two schools apart from any of these other schools. They have a completely different load on their systems and, and energy. Um, the, the primary schools are the, the worst performers, um, mostly due to their size and the year that they are constructed. The year they were constructed, the, the building codes and, and methods for building um, weren't as focused on energy efficiency as uh, something as recent as Wentworth, um, which is uh, uh, performing very well. It actually, in the first year, I think it was um, about, it's right there, 35,000 uh, less per year to operate than predicted. Um, so just giving you a snapshot of just how inefficient those primary buildings are, and then that's multiplied times three, because there's three of them. So here are the options. Um, we, we broke them down, so there's only a, a few per page. But in general, I'll, I'll kind of give the big picture, and we can get into more detail um, at, at the end with questions. But option A is if, if you do nothing, and it's that idea of uh, adding portables being uh, over capacity at the existing schools. Option B, which is one that we'll get into in a lot more detail, is looking at taking sixth grade out of the middle school, putting the sixth grade in Wentworth, taking the third grade out of Wentworth, and creating pre-K through three primary schools. So this option really looks at the programming that's needed in order to, to do that at those three schools. Um, this option closes no schools. Option C is... Um, trying to see from here. <laughs> Option C is, keep, is keeping six through eight in the middle school, so right-sizing the middle school. 
uh, keeping Wentworth at a three through, uh, three through five, uh, so really not doing anything to Wentworth. If, if you remember, Wentworth, when it was designed, was designed with uh, flexibility in mind. There was extra, extra <coughs> classrooms provided there to absorb some growth. That's why in some of these options, we have the ability to move some of these grades around. And then in this option, we look at closing the three primary schools and creating a, a K through two option. I'm just going to turn the page here because I can't, can't quite see. Um, option D um, is the, uh, the Scarborough Middle School. So again, right sizing and, and expanding for some of the shortcomings. Anyone that's been over there knows some of those core spaces are, are very undersized. Um, the Wentworth uh, stays, stays as is. And it, I believe that the, um, there's a, oh yeah, no, it says right there. Uh, the consolidated option is where we have pre-K, so that's a pre-K oh. through two option. Option E. Option E looks at the middle school just having seven through eight. So again, taking the sixth grade out of the middle school and putting the um, third grade, uh, three through six in Wentworth. Um, this will uh, require some additional classrooms in order to, to do this option at Wentworth. The, uh, this closes the three primary schools and then creates a consolidated pre-K through two school. Option F, uh, which is one that we'll get into more detail, so we, we really later on look at comparing B and F uh, together, is looking at the middle school being a seven through eight, so taking the sixth grade and moving it to Wentworth. Wentworth is now a four through six grade school, and we create a consolidated grade pre-K through three. Um, option G is uh, pretty much the, the same as option F, except we have taken pre-K and created a pre-K early learning center. Um, so the consolidated option is K through three. And then option F looks at um, the middle school being uh, seven through eight, Wentworth being four through six, um, there being a pre-K through K early education center and a consolidated grades one through through three. <coughs> so the summary of that is there's many ways we can look at this. And um, we, will, we will arrive at, at what, what is the best option. Um, but what we did is we took option B and F um, and, and really went further with them. Um, B is the least consolidated option. It keeps all three primary schools open. And F really being the most consolidated option, closing all three and, and creating one school that has pre-K through three. Lisa, before you go into that detail, I would just like to also add that when we, um, although we're having lots of fun thinking about what the solutions might be, and as Lisa said, there are many, uh, when it comes to the work with the Department of Education, we're not providing them with solutions, we're just sharing our problems, and then if and when we um, end up on the funding list, then they look at our study and they help develop what is the best option for our community. So that's just... A lot of this is hypothetical in this moment. Correct, correct. And, and we're doing that with, with several school districts right now. They have the same, same applications went in. They had several schools they applied for, got funding for, for multiple schools, and the DOE sat with, with us and them to figure out what they're really interested in, what is the best solution? How do we solve the, the, the problem? Um, so with that being said, we're going to jump to... Um, slide 17 really breaks down the pros and cons between option B and option F. The first four, four bullets are essentially the same. So we minimize the scope of work at the middle school by moving the sixth grade to Wentworth. So really uh, alleviate, alleviating that overcapacity issue. There will be some renovations that have to occur there. Um, Wentworth would remain the four through six and no new classrooms would be added. Um, the grade three um, moves to the consolidated primary school. Um, <clears throat> and in option B, it just moves to the primary schools. Um, Pre-K is provided in both schemes. And here's where they differ. So option B closes no schools. Option F closes three schools and creates a new school. Um, in B, the buildings will be right-sized to accommodate the increase in population and existing space shortages. <laughs> 
Um, and in option F, the, we have a clean slate. We're able to create a building that both houses the increased population, allows us to incorporate all the program spaces we need and do it as efficiently and cost effectively as possible. Um, option B, here's the caveat. So however, the, the facilities, when we look at expanding them to really house and be right sized, they can't fit on their current site. So in order to create three primary schools in their existing location and have all the spaces we need, we have found you can't get them to fit on the site. And you'll see that in the site plans in a little bit. And so the reason we chose B, B and F was really so we had an apples to apples comparison programmatic wise. And it really paints the, the clearest apples to apples. And then from there, we can use it as a tool to, to explore whatever other options we want to explore. So just to reiterate what, what Julie said, there's eight options so far we've explored. Um, two we've really gotten down into the details on. There's several ways to look at this. Um, what we're about to show you is that Consolidation will save money and resources, and it's just about what option it is that we, we end up exploring further. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Thank you, Lisa. As Julie was saying earlier, uh, if you get on the funding list and, and, and get DOE funding for a project, um, they want to be in control of the process, understandably, and they will uh, want to drive everything. But I think that they'll appreciate all the work that you have done over the past four years and looking at lots and lots of options. At this point, I can't imagine that there are too many more options or, or grade reconfigurations that you could, you could uh, uh, imagine. And I think it could potentially maybe speed up your process with the DOE because you have a lot of data on a lot of options now that they can uh, uh, you know, chew over and then make decisions on. So I think that the work that you're doing now will be very, very helpful. I, I, I know it was helpful in your application mm -hmm. to the state because you, you had a, just a, a mountain of information in there about your uh, current uh, conditions. So all, all of that is good. So w we did what, what turned out to be a really interesting exercise, which was to take option B and option F. Uh, again, option B is the one where the three primary schools stay on their sites, but they get expanded and right-sized uh, to take care of the uh, increasing population, to take care of pre-K uh, uh, growth in your, in your district, and to, and to uh, right-size all the spaces that we could reasonably do to DOE standards. So you have uh, a lot of spaces in these three primary schools that are not to DOE standards. And, and that can be a problem, and it particularly would be a problem if you add more and more and more kids uh, to those buildings. So we did a series of exercises with the school department. One of the first things we did is we sat down uh, with all the administrators and we uh, did a count of all of the teachers and all the ed techs and staff members in each school right now. And um, then we looked at what that population of teachers would, would, would be uh, in 2025 when you have you know, 100 plus more students in, the, in each of those buildings and we made a list of those. From that list, we could then say, okay, um, how many people uh, would you need to fund in, in, uh, in these 2025 options? We got uh, salary numbers from, from Kate Bolton uh, based on the various class, classes of people that, uh, that we looked at, and we built a budget for uh, the option B, the three schools in 2025. And then we did the same exercise for option F, which was the consolidated school. And when we did that, we found that, that you didn't have to provide the same services, uh, same people in each of the three schools. If you had one building, you could consolidate the number of, of people that you have uh, running the school and teaching in your, in your schools. And that change was pretty dramatic. It was more dramatic than, than, uh, than I would have uh, thought. And then the next step was to create a, a list of all those rooms and to uh, do design, a preliminary design studies on the three uh, primary schools with all of the rooms and all the spaces uh, at the right size uh, so that we could compare the size of three renovation projects, renovation additions, then with a consolidated school. And then from that, we did, we did drawings or site plans and, and uh, floor plans on that. It, it's important to, to understand that the, uh, the renovation scope of work, we had to, had to make sure that we were careful about that because you're comparing 
existing buildings that are being renovated with a brand new building and there are differences in the way that the cost estimator looks at those and differences in in the way that they're designed and built you can't always do everything in an existing building in renovations in terms of energy efficiency that you can do in uh, in new construction and you tend to have more square feet in a in a renovated building than in a new one because in theory in a new one you can compact it any way that you want to whereas in existing building renovation you, you're you're uh, left with some spaces that you need to to keep there so it reduces your options so we we said that we would renovate the existing buildings uh, to modern technical and educational standards uh, we would remove all the existing modulars and place them with permanent space we would upgrade existing mechanical electrical plumbing life safety systems to be up to code and substantially more energy efficient we would upgrade all the buildings to the current building codes because they're not at this point uh, and including ADA we would improve the building envelope because a lot of the energy that is lost in a building is is lost in the walls and in the roof and in old buildings uh, that's that can be a, a big problem for example the original wings of each of the primary schools um, are basically solid brick on the outside solid concrete block on the inside mortared together no insulation so the the separation between you know the kids and teachers on the inside and the atmosphere and temperature on the outside is basically masonry which conducts uh, cold very very well so those walls have what they call an R value which is a measure of how energy efficient they are of 3.5 whereas in a modern building the R value that you would target would be 20.5 so you can you can see that that the older buildings uh, are can be much less energy efficient and and that costs you money over time now you can do some things to improve that but it's difficult to take an old masonry wall that's all mortared together and make it as energy efficient as a as, as a new wall so we we looked at all of those things and then when we when we came up with these plans we gave them to an estimator a professional estimator uh, in, in Portland and they developed the numbers for us So here is Blue Point. We'll start with Blue Point. And um, of course, here's the road outside, uh, the main driveway in, uh, existing parking. There's a bus loop uh, right here, uh, for those of you who may not know the school. The, the, the striking feature and the restricting feature of Blue Point is that along the back of the school, turning and going to the side, there is a significant drop in elevation. And so it really cons either constrains you completely from developing over the top of that uh, or makes it much, much more expensive. Just to give you an idea, the, the difference in elevation between the front door of the school here and that play field back there is 18 feet. And they're pretty, they're pretty, uh, they're not good soils. Uh, you can see this green area back here, which is the beginning of the wetlands. And even though it's a 12.2 acre site, the vast majority of that site is, is wet. I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's the fringes of the Scarborough Marsh. So it's not great area to, uh, uh, to develop. So you have that on the, the steep slopes on the back in wetlands, steep slopes to the left, you've got property. Uh, private houses to the bottom part of the drawing and par private houses to the right hand side of the drawing so it's very very uh, constrained and that's why currently it's stretched out of this long uh, thin bar double loaded classrooms because they just they couldn't do it any other any other way so the addition you see the dramatic difference the addition would look like this so it, it's a it's a substantial increase uh, in square footage again it's reflecting uh, the requirements of additional population coming to the town, uh, as well as uh, the addition of uh, preschool kids and right sizing of the spaces. So instead of having an undersized combined cafeteria and gym, in, in this scheme, you have you, you keep that uh, cafeteria space as a cafeteria space and you put in a small gym uh, to the DOE standards, which isn't as big as a regulation gym, say, of the kind that you'd have at the high school, but, but it does give separate spaces and allows for more flexibility and, and learning time to, uh, to happen. What we did for the classroom, we, we extended it off to the left of the drawing. Uh, and again, we had done this count of, of classrooms needed based on your uh, uh, student per classroom uh, preferred ratios and that's how we came up with a number of classrooms and then we found that uh, to get the number that we needed for the population if you see there's a stair right here 
where the new building in blue connects with the existing building in orange and a stair right there. Between those two stairs is a two-story piece. So that addition is even bigger than it looks like in a plan in order to get everything in. And again, we, we sized things very, very carefully to be to a DOE standards where we could. There are some rooms that are, that are smaller than that where it just didn't make sense to be tearing out uh, walls. But for the most part, if you were working, we think, with, with the DOE, something of, of about this size would be a, a reasonable proposition for them. And so you can see what happens is it, it, it pretty much dominates the site. The new wing uh, covers completely a playground that's over in, in this area. Uh, down here, there's an existing playground, but right now there's no way to get a parent drop-off at uh, Blue Point. And again, in a, in a new school, you would have a parent drop-off that would be separate from a bus loop, which would be separate from your parking, so that all those vehicle systems would, could act independently and not uh, be on top of each other. And it's a safety issue as well as a, as a, a congestion issue. So the, the town has an ordinance which says that uh, for schools, you need uh, one parking space for every two classrooms, and then you need one parking space for every staff member. Well, when you look at a school of this size and of this population, you end up with uh, uh, parking on the site that is about 107 spaces, plus or minus. So that's a lot of spaces for a site that has, I think, 40 or 42 right now in order to meet the town's ordinances. So uh, it, it's a little bit hard to see in this drawing, but what we did is we extended the parking across here and across down here, basically all along the back of those houses just to get the count that we needed. Again, we can't put that parking out here because of the, of the steep slopes and wetlands. And so we basically just ran it out along that property line. Again, this isn't any kind of final design. What we were trying to do was just to fit things and see what that felt like. But it shows you how, how great the impact of the student population and the teachers that would follow uh, would be on, on, the, on the site. So we tried to squeeze in a kind of a little linear playground area right here. But it's not, you know, it's not great. It's not in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, a really uh, great position or a great configuration. And then what would happen, if we, if we kept the, the, the floor level, the first floor level of this new wing at the first floor level of, of the end of the existing wing, you'd end up bringing in a, a ton of fill to, to raise the ground, which again is falling off in that direction, to get it so that we could align the existing slab and the new slab, which is a positive thing. You have uh, three levels in that building already, and it seemed like a shame to add, say, two more levels to those three and have that building just keep dropping and dropping and dropping down the hill. It's more expensive construction, and it, and it breaks up the building in a way that we think is, is, uh, is not very positive. So that, that is the impact of, of uh, your growth to 2025 as shown in the uh, new housing model uh, and 150 pre-K at, at Blue Point. And we can come back to these. So here's eight corners. And eight corners has a 5.75 acre site. Um, it is bordered on the back by um, uh, significant uh, commercial development back here. And then, and, oops, and then houses uh, on, on either side. It has, um, right now it has no parent drop off. It has a bus loop, but there's not enough room currently with the current population to have a separate bus loop from a separate um, uh, a parent drop off. And it has very minimal parking as any of you would know who have, who have gone there for events. So in a scheme that adds, again, um, well over 100 students, this is what it starts to look like. We can, we can start with the parking over on the left-hand side. Again, using the same um, calculus that, uh, that's in the town ordinance, we ended up putting a, a, a new parking lot that extends across the entire left-hand side of the site and then has to turn uh, to the right to get the, the count needed because, as you, as you can see, there really is no other place to put any uh, significant parking. And because that parking lot is so extended, we have to put a, a turnaround at the end because you can't have somebody go down 40 or 50 spaces only to find out that there are no empty spaces and then have to back up or try to turn around inside of the, of the driving lane. So that takes up even more space. Right now, there is um, a, a play area, a, a grassy field, 
kind of a running field and a playground area back there, but we'd be eating into that uh, significantly to get, to get that parking. There's also, uh, again, a, a topographic um, complication in that the level of the main existing building, uh, go, that level of the site goes up about eight feet to get to this uh, higher level there. So we're kind of uh, constrained down on this end. I mean, we could move that earth, but we tried to see, well, can we fit everything in uh, and bump up against that eight foot rise and, and see what that looks like. Whoops. So in this case, what happens is this wing right here is a two-story wing in order to get the count of, of classrooms, teaching spaces that we need. So you see there's a stair on that end and a stair on that end. This is one story, but, um, but if this option went forward at some point in the future, I wouldn't be surprised to see that two-story piece having to turn and go down on that, uh, that wing right there just, just to get the count right. But, but anyway, as, as it is right now, uh, you've got a, a basically 24 classroom two-story wing over here, new classrooms over here, an expansion to the kitchen here, and then back here would be your library and your, your new gym. So again, you would have a separate new gym space and you would keep your existing cafeteria space as it is. As it turns out, the if, if they're just as serving as cafeterias, uh, the multi-purpose rooms in those three primary schools are about what they should be. Uh, but again, you can see the, uh, the constraints on the side. And even with all of that, we have bus drop off in the front here with parking on the other side, which is not the greatest uh, setup. Typically, you like to have the bus loop as a completely separate system like you have at, at Wentworth. And there's no, there's no place for a parent drop off. Over here on the lower right-hand corner, is a great big detention basin. Um, conceivably, you could put that in underground chambers. Uh, that, that ha some of that had to happen at Wentworth because that site was, was somewhat constricted. But there's no easy or logical place to put a parent drop-off, and there's not a lot of frontage on the street to get uh, separate traffic systems for those two things uh, easily. So the third primary school is Pleasant Hill, <clears throat> and again, from the, from the road, or, or let's say the entrance to the school right here, to the back end of the property, the site is dropping, I think, around maybe somewhere between 13 and 15 feet, I believe. You can't tell it in this aerial photograph, but it drops uh, significantly. And again, you have very, very minimal parking right here. You do have a bus loop here, but no parent drop-off. Um, and you've, and, and the, the site is heavily wooded at this, at this point. By adding the number of people, the number of students and teachers and, and conforming to the town ordinances, you'd have a project that would look like this. So the first thing that would happen is you would have to pretty much clear cut the site. Um, and you would be, you'd be building to, uh, almost to the, uh, to the back end of the site, which again is dropping 13 to, to uh, 15 feet from where it is in the front. You'd have another long parking row extending along that right hand uh, property line. And because of that, and because of the size of the, of the building, again, a two-story wing in this location, uh, you'd have a minimal playground uh, area back here. Uh, you would still have this playground area off to the left that is existing, but you can see it, it really maxes out the, it maxes out the site. And, and you know, we, we feel like on all three schemes, it really, they aren't good, um, they aren't good solutions because the sites are too small. If you had to do this for some reason, uh, maybe you could do it, but it, 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 they're very, very, very constrained. We think it's you know, not, not a great solution. And there would be basically little to no growth, uh, no room for future growth coming in the future. So the next slide looks at uh, a proposal that I think some of you have seen before, a potential proposal in the past, which is a consolidated school. And in, in this case, what we were looking at was, is there enough room in the, oops, wow. Is there enough room in the back of the property behind the middle school uh, of good enough quality that you could put a school building back there? There we go. There we go. So the last time the site was surveyed both for topography and for uh, wetlands was probably 10 years plus. So in order to really test whether something like this is a viable option, you'd need to update those studies. And in particular, you would need to look at um, um, vernal pools. You'd have to test for vernal pools. Is this wetland? <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, so what we've shown is two areas that are relatively free, not completely free, but relatively free with the 10 plus year old wetlands mapping that was done of wetlands. So there are areas where, you know, you might, hopefully you would start out with having minimal wetlands to, uh, to deal with and, and to mitigate. Uh, the, the issue with both of those blue sites is that there are contours going off to the right on the lower site and contours going from the middle school uh, down to the top of, uh, of the upper blue site. So the building would have to uh, be built to adjust to those contours in some fashion. But again, we don't know exactly the configuration of those yet, and we, and we certainly don't know uh, anything about the environmental restrictions that may exist on the site. One, th one thing that, that is potentially uh, exciting is the possibility that you could extend your existing campus. Whoops, I keep hitting the wrong one. Sorry. Extend the existing campus um, uh, traffic circulation system uh, back to the back uh, to Sawyer. As it turns out, uh, although Sawyer is lined with houses on this side and houses on this side, uh, the town owns a little spur of land that goes right to Sawyer, uh, miraculously, and it's right where that, that, that road ends. So in theory, in order to access this new site and in order to uh, provide a second way in and out of the entire campus for the middle school, you could extend the road going down that hill uh, and put a sidewalk alongside of it, and that would be a great thing for a, a number of, of reasons. As, as you may remember from earlier presentations, um, the, the, it, it, it's not that the middle school site is unsafe in terms of vehicles, but it is really constricted. And if you had a couple of cars that were stuck in that lane when there was a fire or something, it, you know, there could be an issue. So all along, since, since 2013, we've been looking at the potential of another way out into the, the world from that uh, campus. So here's how it breaks down. Um, basically, because of duplications of space and duplications of faculty, uh, the option B, which is expanding the three primary schools, uh, has more square footage, needs more square footage than, than option F, the consolidated school. So for the three blue point uh, uh, schemes that you just saw, those total 204,905 square feet, and option F would be about 171,568. And again, these are very early sketches and very early drawings. Those numbers may go up and down a little bit, but there's no doubt that you will have uh, many thousands of square feet of savings of building in option F by consolidating then uh, renovating and expanding three uh, primary schools. And that's forever. So no matter how energy efficient the, the, the buildings are, having 33,000 square feet more in the, in the option B scheme is just gonna cost you more forever, pretty much. So that's, that's one advantage that option F has. The second advantage is, we, we, again, we had a professional estimator uh, take um, the drawings and, a, and a, a written scope of work that we had prepared and had and prepared cost estimates for all three uh, of the primary schools and then for a consolidated school. So the three primary schools added up to about 60,204,834, and the option F scheme was 58,205,940. So again, as it stands right now, um, the construction costs and, and the soft costs, things like uh, testing in soils and uh, all of those kinds of things that you add to create the total project costs, you'd save just under $2 million in construction and total project costs in the consolidated building. And again, that can be affected by the site, it can be affected by uh, wetlands mitigation, all kinds of things, but I, I think it, it's, it's certain, there's no doubt that the three larger buildings versus the smaller brand new building will cost more and, and will be bigger in size. The third thing that we did is we then took those um, uh, total project costs and we went on the main bond bank uh, website and you can plug in your numbers and give them a, um, a, a borrowing time, which we were told would be 30 years. And uh, they basically spit out a, 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 a payback uh, projection with principal and interest for the entire 30 years of the bond. Now, it's a, it's a generic program and the actual interest rate that you might get or the length of the bond or any number of things uh, could affect that. But right now, the three, the option B and the option F are using the same program, the same interest rates, the same everything. 
And when you look at it over time, you'd save about $3.3 million in principal and interest payments by, using the, by building the consolidated school than by building and expanding three existing. And so even if that's $3 million or 2.5 or whatever, depending on the market and, and the uh, interest rate that you can get as a municipality, it's still a substantial amount of money, obviously. So when we, when we look at option B and F and we look at the way the existing buildings are built, this may be hard for everybody to see, but <clears throat> the first column um, shows the uh, Blue Point, Eight Corners, and Pleasant Hill School, and then it looks at the construction of the existing exterior walls in their various phases uh, and what the R value of, of those walls are. And then it looks at, uh, eventually it looks at the R values of, of the new construction in those. And you can see that, that, that just taking Blue Point, which is pretty similar to all, all of them, the original, um, I'm not going to do that again, push that button. Uh, the original wing has, a, has an R value of, of 3. Again, 20.5 would be the target today. The, um, the second addition to that building, or, or actually the first addition to that building, has an R value of, of just under 13. The modulars we show there, but we would be removing the modulars, and despite what the manufacturers say, they're, they're not terribly energy efficient, and they're, uh, you know, they're, they're not uh, robust construction. I'll just put it that way. And then the roof, uh, at, at, because it was built in various times and has been repaired in various times, is anywhere from an R10 to an R30 in those buildings. And again, in the new building, what we would shoot for would be R38. So if you look at, at that, that uh, second column, the, you can see the, the items in orange are items that do not meet current energy codes. When you look at the next column over, which is option B, you have some, some existing construction remaining, some is, is removed, and then you have new construction which will be brought up to code, and so there are more uh, of the building envelope that is uh, to current codes, but not as much as a new building which would have 100% uh, uh, of the walls in the roof uh, to, to code. And, and the, the, sort of the, the, the saying in, in energy efficiency mm -hmm. is that, that the three most important things you can do uh, for energy efficiency and keeping your costs low is to make sure you have uh, the best envelope, the best envelope, and the best envelope. That the interior systems, you know, heating and cooling and things like that are important, and you want to buy the best systems possible, but you're starting behind if you have a building that you're trying to heat and cool that's already leaking uh, either your cooling or your heating out into the atmosphere. So, so uh, that's why we said we, we, would, we would work to, uh, and, and look at the envelopes with great care if you went with an option B. One thing we might do would be to replace all the windows with modern triple glaze, very, very, very energy efficient high-tech windows as, as one uh, potential option. So <clears throat> comparative personnel costs. Uh, one of the things that's always interesting is to, to see what to, to model what what your uh, projected cost might be today and then what your projected cost might be in the future. So one dramatic thing to look at would be the savings in uh, personnel costs that we've talked about before. The blue line, oops, <laughs> the blue line, there we go, yep, there we go. The blue line is option B, which is uh, renovating the three existing schools, and the red line is option F, which is a consolidated school. So you look at the cost. If, if, if those two buildings were open today uh, on your site, you'd be spending about uh, $13 million, uh, plus for all the personnel needed in option F, and you'd be spending $17.7 .7 million for all the personnel needed in, in option B. So if you just take those two and you, and you start them uh, year one, year two, year three, again, whether it happens uh, next year, five years, ten years from now, uh, there will always be this difference. And, and you project it out, you see that, that those lines just diverge more and more and more every year. This particular chart assumes that you had a 3% per year annual inflation rate for your uh, personnel. And one of the reasons that this is important is that when we got all the numbers of all your operating costs for each of your schools from Kate Bolton, and when we added them all up, we saw that 92% of the cost, roughly, of each of those primary schools is just personnel, salaries and benefits. And the other 8%, sometimes it's 9, sometimes it's 7, 
is everything else that you need to run the school, heating and cooling and books and the buses and, and, and everything. So, so to the extent that you can make the buildings more efficient, smaller in size, more compact, and um, reduce overlaps in, in staffing, uh, particularly in staffing, you can potentially save quite a bit of money. So again, even if um, at some point in the future you did this and you had a different number of faculty than, than what was projected by the administrators when we did this exercise, and it was a blind exercise. We, we, we just put it all together, they made their, their judgments, and then Lisa and I took them back to the office, and that's when we, we discovered what a dramatic difference it was between uh, the two options. So it'll, it'll, it'll always have that savings in the future, and so it is something that you should think about when you're investing money in, in new buildings, is trying to make things as efficient and cost effective as possible. So then in summary, overall advantages of option F, less square feet to operate and maintain in the future, and as I said, that's, that's forever. Higher R values in the building envelope, 100% of the building would meet current energy codes. You'd have new, highly energy efficient uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing building systems married to a very, very tight building envelope, very energy efficient building envelope. Less cost to build the facility. You'd have equity of services. I mean, you can imagine that if, if, um, uh, if there's a service that your particular child needs that's only offered in one of your primary schools, you could conceivably be living in a different part of town and as a parent having to drive between two schools to, to have your kids um, uh, needs uh, taken care of. In a, in a consolidated building, you can have the same um, services provided by fewer people all together and, and in, in theory that would be an, an immense improvement for the, for the kids. So equity of services, fully ADA accessible, uh, it would meet the current town ordinances and building codes, fewer staff needed to uh, operate the school. Um, and then of course, and that's really with either project, you would, uh, you would sort of r reset all of the CIP projects that you have uh, coming at you for the next 20 years. You basically would do all of them in these renovations and additions so that you sort of reset the clock and you're starting with uh, new facilities. And then last but not least, that all portables would be removed. And that's it. So we'll turn it back to you, Julie, and uh, or you, Donna. Sorry, <laughs> and we can uh, answer you, any Dan. questions that you may have. Thank you, Dan and, and Lisa. Um, that certainly was a comprehensive look at it. And I we've been working a, very hard. We have to work on this, and you have been for the past several years. So, uh, are there any questions or comments from any board members? Yes, Jody. Sure, I have a bunch. I don't know how to go about this organized because I feel like we're all going to have a ton of questions. But how did we, um, why did we decide, first of all, on uh, 2025? Was that just a, a that, date? That's how far out your current projection goes to. Okay. Um, it goes out 10 years. That's the typical standard for planning decisions because beyond 10 years, it, it, it gets harder and harder to predict what, what may be happening. So you had this done in 2015-16 and the current projections in in 2025-26. Okay. And, and so the state usually does a 10-year, they look at 10 years of our... They're only projections. looking at five. They're only looking at five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That, that appears to be a change in their, yeah. their mm -hmm. policy that's... Okay. Recent. So I guess I'll get to the end, and then we can always come back to me once I've looked at <coughs> stuff. But when I was looking at the plans for the primary schools, it looks like all three primary schools lose playground space significantly. Yes. And I, I know, or my perception is that the general public thinks well it's that's not a big deal but these are also k through two students right. who need this time outside is a significant part of learning for right. k through two students yes um when i looked at blue point <clears throat> i was glad you finally pointed out that little strip in the middle there because at first i was like the playground looks like it's in the middle of the parking lot mm. <laughs> and so that made me nervous yeah. but then i saw up here it's a little closer to the school but it's still very confined. Yes. It's very small. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I was seeing that right. And now with the parking, 
I know the ordinance, the town ordinance is one parking spot for two classrooms and one for each teacher. We're not adhering to that ordinance at the moment. No. Even no, I don't. <laughs> I don't think so. I actually haven't run those numbers, but I could. Like eight corners <laughs> looks like a mall parking lot at this point. Yeah. In this new. No, we do. We do not have adequate parking at any of the K twos currently. So, like, I was at two of them today, and I could not find a spot. With no events happening. So, what is the ramifications of that? Like, I mean, we're currently not adhering to the. Ordinance. We're hoping that gets us points in the DOC, <laughs> the DOE yeah. rating yeah. cycle application. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I, then I, for the um, site plan of like this campus that you had, what is, um, like it shows the high school and the football field, what is that space directly across from the football field? Is that wetlands? Yeah, that one. Um, yeah, it doesn't show that well in the slide. Uh, to the left of the, yeah, all the, the shaded areas that you see in that drawing are, are wetlands that were mapped again 10, 15 or more years ago. Okay. And uh, the reason that the, that the uh, DEP requires you to redo them, they can't be older than five years typically when you start a process like this, is because they can change. I mean, they can get bigger, they can get smaller. And between the time that that, that survey was done and today, uh, vernal pools have become a very, very important environmental uh, feature to uh, preserve, and I, 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 you know, I think it's very likely that there are going to be some vernal pools in that in that area because I mean it's just classic. It's, you know, sloping site with little pockets of you know where water can collect, and uh, you, you, but you can only test those in the spring. Uh, and when the snow starts to melt, water collects, and certain species of, of amphibians come out, and that's when they breed. And, and so depending on the type of species, you may need to protect it, or it may not be an issue. I mean, I've had it go both ways uh, in, in schools. But, but it's definitely uh, an important thing that you need to, to map. You don't have to do that right away because it, this work will be done uh, perhaps sometime in the future. But before you can really test if any of this is, is feasible, you need to do some serious environmental mapping and soils testing and things like that. I would say one more thing, Jody, that if, if again, if you compare what site amenities you would get in a new school, in addition to having separate bus drop-off, uh, separate parent drop-off, separate parking, uh, you would also have uh, a play field. You know, for, for any, if, if the DOE were to fund any one of these as a separate project, you would have a, a pretty good sized play field as well as a, a good sized playground because kids at this age in particular not only need to play on, on, uh, on gym equipment, but they need to run and, and, and move around. Movement is very important. And actually, um, <clears throat> pre K K students require different equipment than older students. That's right. So. Dan, I have a you question have in regards to that hey, well, while you were on there. Yes. I know that uh, behind the middle school there were some vernal pools that we had explored before. Yes. And are they still there? I, are they I don't know. Again, this, this was a drawing that we got um, years ago that's, that's in your database. Okay. But uh, we haven't seen a drawing that, and I don't know if you have one or not, that located vernal pools that you found in the past. And even if they were there, you'd have to, you'd have to redo the study mm -hmm. to make sure that they're current, because these things can change. Okay. Any other questions? Mary? In the pockets for the, you know, the spaces for the new schools, so with those spaces, it, there's adequate space for the parking and the two loops, the parent loop and the bus loop, or is that assumed? No, there's or not, you, there's not any, there's not enough space for uh, parent drop-off in those schemes that you mm -hmm. saw. I mean, the, Oh, in the new. Oh, one. those in the new one. Yes, there, there, we think that there would be yeah. overall. But again, we would first need to know what land there you could just develop like that because the soils are good and they're not wet, and and you know that the topo is is reasonable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in theory, there should be enough room out there again to have those uh, collection of features that I talked about. And I would just add that these two locations that are on page 27, this is from the existing, prior to my arrival, the study that had been done. 
Um, right now, the town is currently going through a master campus, a campus master planning process. So again, a lot of this is just hypothetical. We're wondering if that could be a good location, but obviously this has to fit into like what are the priorities of the town and how we would use the master campus. Right. Mm -hmm. But our job is right, really to, um, as the town is doing all of this long range comprehensive planning, we have to be able to give them sort of what is that, what are our projected needs in the future, and we've been working on that since I arrived, and finally we're ready to hand it over. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else, Mary? I just have one other question on page five, when you were talking about the enrollment projections. I didn't know what delta was. What did, what did that change? What was that in regards? Oh, is that percentage to me? It's the just change. The amount, the change. So plus 94 students, plus 107 students, plus 101. Okay, then what's the P? Cause I, okay, I thought the PK. Pre oh, that's pre-K. I'm sorry. So I think I was, I was thinking that was an increase. That was the increase. Okay, gotcha. Right. That was a misunderstanding. Anyone else? Yes. Um, a, a couple. Uh, just real quick, while we were back here at the beginning about the um, portables, I would, I would guess that rather than, for instance, adding. Um, six more portables to eight corners, we probably would redraw some lines, right? So this is just working on the areas of Scarborough that are assigned to these particular schools yes. as they, they currently are. Yes. Okay. And the um, and the so the plans that you did were also kind of assuming that same thing, right? Yes, that's a good point to, to, to point out. We assume that uh, the, the the catchment area that you have, your your boundary lines between schools would remain where they are. Um, but none of the none of the if you had one school for instance that had an extra 10 acres mm -hmm. then you could really start thinking right. about right. using those boundary lines to to your advantage but you don't really have that it, it, and currently two of our three k2s are at max capacity right even right. though we're at a low a, a low point in our enrollment right and, I mean even seeing how much these plans push those spaces right even if we could redraw lines all we wanted and still those those sites are going to be maxed out yeah so my other question was about the middle school and I know that this was mostly looking at just the elementary schools but um, thinking about what right sizing the middle school means for just seventh and eighth grade could you just spend a moment speaking about that Yes, we, we've done some thinking about that, but we, we um, in talking to Julie, we thought we were going to give you enough information uh, tonight just to focus on the primary schools. And we've, we've talked about the middle school a couple times before, but uh, moving the sixth grade out of the middle school into Wentworth and then shifting another grade out of, out of Wentworth to the, to the primaries greatly, massively reduces the amount of work you'd have to do the middle school because you go from... 750 or whatever you have right now into the mid to, to high 400 students. So you, you just have, all of a sudden have spaces open up that you desperately need. You know, your, your cafeteria and kitchen would be more the size that they should be mm -hmm. um, for the population that would be there. Same thing for the library. It just it, it trickles down one on top of the other. If, if you were to do that, one thing that you'd want to consider um, would be to upgrade your all your mechanical electrical systems at that time because for example your air conditioning system at the middle school is still functioning but you have a you know 20 year old technology an old water uh, a cooled uh, a cooling system a water tower cooling system and it's not very efficient as you can see how it compares to uh, to uh, uh, Wentworth and so you probably want to do a, a, a cost benefit analysis if you spent this much upgrading all your mechanical systems you would you would get a payback on that return over some period of time same thing for for lighting i don't i don't know how many of the the existing lights at the middle school um todd has replaced already with leds but you could do that kind of study uh, you'd want to get rid of the passamaquoddy modulars you know the the uh, the building seems to be like it could pretty much handle two grades without having modular. So that'd be another thing you'd want to verify, though. Uh, and again, work with the the, uh, the principal and count every room and every function and every teacher and make sure that it all worked. But it, it, I think that we gave you an estimate two, three years ago now, I think, for expanding the middle school in place as a grade six through eight school. And it was 17 or $18 million three years ago. So if you if you took all those kids out from the sixth grade, it would be substantially less than that. I, I don't know what that number would be. We haven't had time to look at that. But again, it seemed like a, a good investment in, in, in dollars to 
minimize the amount of money you'd have to spend at the middle school and then build a, um, a, a consolidated primary school and get all the energy efficiencies and, 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 and cost efficiencies that that would uh, give you. And it, it, that's, the, that's the cohort of kids that is the tidal wave that seems to be coming at you. So do, dealing with the, by expanding pre-K and reducing costs by taking a grade out of the middle school just seems like a good idea. Wentworth was designed uh, theoretically for 800 students. You could probably put a few more students in that. In it, we actually did studies where we added a whole grade to Wentworth. We did all kinds of things like that. Um, but um, Wentworth is, is, is big enough to be able to, to, to you know, sort of your, your slip space from, from option to option. And, and it's uh, good to have that resource. Anything else, Jody? Um, the funding <laughs> list from the state, the DOE funding list, Portland just passed that they're going to build four new schools or renovate four renovate new schools four. on their own. Yeah. Do they come off the list? Yeah. There was 81 schools on the list. Oh. I'm already counting yes. them. Yes. <laughs> <Right. laughs> uh, yeah. Do you know how many schools the DOE has said they'll fund? No. Uh, you know, Jody, that is, that is the... Um, <laughs> That's the million dollar question, yeah. Um, in this current cycle, they ended up, by the, by the time they kept getting new infusion of cash here and there, over a four or five year period, they ended up funding, I think, 15, maybe 16. I'm not sure about it. I'll, I'll get that number for you. Mm. Uh, originally, they thought they were only going to do maybe 10, and they've done, again, another five or six more. It's It's been uh, six or seven years since that last round took applications, so it, it's been a very long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I wouldn't expect that, that they would fund, uh, you know, 25 schools. I, I just, and if they did, it would probably be over a, a, a very extended time frame. And they're funding so. projects, so if, if there's some schools in other areas where they might have three schools on the list, but they end up needing a consolidated school to be more efficient and effective, then that would move everybody up three spaces. Yeah. Right. If, like, for us, for example, if, if we magically made it to the top of the list and then we consolidated our three K-2s, everyone else would be able to move up. Right. And then on option C, which I know we didn't really get into today, but where does the pre-K go in option C? Do we know? Well, the, the way that it started, it, it pre-K wasn't in the mix when we started. And over time, as we developed options, we kept having meetings and talking about it, it became clear that uh, pre-K needed to be included. So we didn't, in, in that list of eight options, pre-K isn't in every, every one of them. I think it's, it's in really most of them now. And we could upgrade them all so that they all have pre-K. It just, it's just one of those things that developed over time. Oh. And then we ended up focusing on, on options B and F because they're sort of the polar opposite of each other. A clear scheme where there's three buildings that, that remain in place and get expanded and a clear scheme where uh, they're given back to the town and a consolidated building is built. And then there are all those other permutations of things like using Pleasant Hill as a kindergarten center or using Eight Corners as a pre-K K center, something like that. Um, that sort of leads me to my next question was what happens to the schools? They go to the, they get turned question. over to the town? Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. I still have a couple yeah, more. Are, well, yep. I had a, are any of the current primary schools big enough to be a pre-K center? Yeah, well, <clears throat> again, there are two options. I, I've, uh, like Lisa, I've, I've, uh, I have uh, option overload uh, in my head. But we have, a, we have an option towards the end that is, uh, converting um, uh, Pleasant Hill to a kindergarten center. And again, I mean, as an option, you could pretty much just move into that building um, and, and, and have what you need. Pre-K at 150 students, uh, if it's all day pre-K, would be 10 classrooms. It's about 15 students per classroom using the state standard. So uh, Pleasant Hill would work for that pretty well. Eight Corners is a bigger school. So if you wanted to have a pre-K K center, uh, eight corners might be uh, uh, something to look at. I'm not sure if you would need any 
modifications or additions to that or not but yeah uh, pre-k k so if you think about the number of kindergartners that we have we have over 600 kindergartners okay so, then that wouldn't work yeah yeah, <coughs> yeah. Oh, or, no, um, no. i'm sorry i'm i'm <laughs> we'll have in 2025 we'll have 80 kindergartners and e about 80 kindergartners in each of the um three schools oh, okay. so together so with 40. the with the um pre-k pre you wouldn't be able to fit them in one school Right. in any one of our current schools without adding to them right sorry i was thinking about all k2s right. um and also when you look out at those projections those are the grades where we're expecting the most growth right and then you then you lose some at least of, of the benefits of consolidation in terms of reduced square footage and and reduced uh, uh staffing costs you also said Two more, I promise. Okay. <laughs> How big is Wentworth? How many square feet? 163,000. Thank you, Todd. Very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then my last question is um, the savings for doing a consolidated pre-K free school seems significant. So at some point there must be a break-even point, right? Instead of mandating yes. the three primary schools, mm -hmm. yes. continuing to be inefficient there, mm -hmm. consolidating it, there must be a point where we hit break-even. Right. I would. Yes. We we haven't calculated that. That that mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a possible exercise. It's just not a quick and and simple exercise. But yes, you would think so. Yeah. Because again, those the, those two lines that you saw in the personnel projections are basically always going to diverge, and that area between them represents the area of savings uh, that you would that you would have. Okay. Anyone else? So I just wanted to follow up on that pre-K idea because, as you know, the states also recently mentioned the CDS children. Hmm and they could be age three yeah to five right so we're so counting them in the pre-k did numbers. you count those yeah. in, you yeah. count, included those in yeah. in the projections yeah. okay and but if we continue to have the three small schools we might before we even do anything at all we might have those kids as our responsibility right before that right so if that happens then and we kept the three schools because, well, we actually we can't because the two, two are overloaded now, right? Two are at max capacity two now. Two are at max now, so we wouldn't. We'd only have the one school that we'd we even have. We have one classroom available at Blue Point right one now. One classroom. Right. Of the three primary schools, we have one classroom at Blue Point. Yes. And do we have any sense? One extra. Yeah. Do we have any sense of how many CDS kids are currently being serviced aged three to five? 75, approximately 75. That's where the 150 came from. We were looking at what is the current number of three, four, and five-year-olds um, living in Scarborough who are scheduled to receive CDS services, and right. then we doubled it because if we were going to house a, pr a program, a preschool program, we would want it to be an integrated program. Right. That doesn't mean, though, just to add that um, it can look a lot of different ways in terms of how each district ends up taking over those services. Um, it could be partnering with some of our private preschools that we have now. It could be um, servicing children in their homes. We would want to be thinking long range, though, how do we do it in the most efficient, effective way? And if we right. want to see those returns on investments that... Um, the research is showing those that is in-house full-day pre-k right preschool well, I mean it's a right. many towns in the state of Maine already have the four-year-olds on board it's 70 percent to have a town like ours where we're not servicing any four-year-olds so I think that you know that's probably going to be a way we're going to have if we have to do this fast, I mean, like in a year or two, taking we're going over the to CDS. have to be thinking about other ways in the community to, to serve the, you know, 
the four-year-olds and possibly the three-year-olds at the mm -hmm. same time. Yes. So um, Joanne, our assistant superintendent, is asking, actually putting together a preschool task force. Um, so we're trying to gather as much information as we can. Um, and Kelly Mullen Martin, who is our principal at Blue Point, will also be a member of that, along with several teachers and school board members will be invited too. Um, I don't know if you want to talk more about that, Joanne, and sort of what your plan is to study this. But before she says that, what we're trying to do is you know we're operating off the mindset that it's never too early to plan and we want to be as planful as we can so that when if and when our community is ready to support a project like this that we know is going to be the, in the best financial interests of our community and also allow us to pe provide the best quality services that our homework is done because as Dan said this is not work that's done overnight we've right. been working on it nonstop for the last couple of months and um, we just want to be really thoughtful and be thinking about the options. So Joanne is going to uh, put together just, this task force. We are force. just starting the task force, and uh, we haven't even met yet. We put out a uh, questionnaire to teachers who would like to uh, serve on the task force, and they're in the process of doing that. Our hope is to review all of the state information, look at other schools, what they did, um, visit other schools to see um, how their preschool programs are working and um, and then when the committee uh, with the committee and uh, sign other subcommittees on it and then make a uh, report to the board and to the superintendent um, can I ask clarifying questions? Mm -hmm. the 70% of towns in Maine who do currently have their four-year-olds their pre-k's are they doing that are they covering CDS's services within the schools there or is CDS still is CBS and schools some to my understanding and talking with some people um, that's one of the things we're definitely going to explore but some have CDS with them and some do not okay. and is the DOE um, when they're exploring this change are they talking about schools also taking over the zero to two population or just three to five just and three to five and would three. CDS still be in charge of the zero to mm -hmm. two? Okay. <clears throat> So, and, and my only other question, Dan, is um, regarding the new housing starts in mm -hmm. town. Um, are we in fairly good communication with the town in terms of um, the current projected development that has already been approved in the town? The, the yes. Uh, when your, as I understand it, when your study was done <clears throat> in 2015-16, uh, that uh, planning decisions talked to the uh, town planner at the time, and they looked at uh, uh, developments that were either underway or or coming your way. And uh, she has a statistical model that she uses to try to figure out if you've got. 100 housing units coming uh, and historically that produces X number of, of kids, then she would project forward and say how many, how many kids you might expect to have from the, the development that you, you know, are, are, are undergoing. And that obviously can change because developments can start or stop or development processes. But um, it was, uh, I think, done very thoroughly and very, very well. Uh, she did the same study for, for Yarmouth and the same study for Westbrook and with, with similar results because, again, historically, the best fit model just looks at live births. And in a town like Scarborough, that, that's a big part of the picture, but it's certainly not the whole picture when you've still got uh, uh, energy to develop and land to develop, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I think it's about probably as good a model as uh, you can do given that you're predicting the future and a lot of things can happen or not happen uh, moving forward but, but it definitely needs to be updated in my talking with the person who did this study the two projects that are happening the one over on Haggis Parkway and then the other one over in the eight corners neighborhood they were not included the apartment ah, so okay. um, they that we believe that will have an impact on our schools no and doubt just even with that already we're moving away from the neighborhood school model because we don't have capacity to bring in 20 more students to eight corner school right given right. our current enrollment yeah wow a lot to think about <laughs> <laughs> anyone else before we 
Finish with Dan. Thank you so much, Dan. This was really very helpful tonight. I appreciate all your work, and I'm sure we'll be in touch with you again as we move Bad. along here. And so it's kind of like buying a house. You know, you go through all the paperwork and everything's rush, rush, rush to get everything together, and then nothing until closing. Um, so we're doing all this work. Um, Dan and Lisa have worked an amazing amount of hours to get it to this point so we could share it with our town council and our community, our school board, and our school leaders. And then we'll have our second DOE, our final DOE visits tomorrow, and then we'll wait and see where we are. Right. Um, hopefully June 2018, probably more like fall 2018, um, we'll know where we fall on the funding list. And then at that point, we'll have to reinvigorate all of this work to start to think about what is going to be our timeline. Right. Um, with or without DOE funding, we're going to have some work to do. And and we need to be strategic because if you look back on slide, help me out, Dan, what slide is that that shows <laughs> how long it takes? Um, Which one are you looking for? The one that on slide 12, it gives you a timeline of just whenever our start date is. And I'm not suggesting that it's any time in the near year or so, but I think that whenever we do start, remember it takes one year to design, to do the design of the study, and that once that begins, a year or more, and then 10 months after a referendum, and then two um, to three years, depending if it's DOE supported or not, for the construction. Right. So I think that's a timeline. Pretty quickly, we're in numbers that sound really far away. Um, so I think we just need to be cognizant of where we are and where we're going constantly. Right. And that, that four-year time frame was exactly the time frame that Wentworth followed. I mean, it's not many ways to shorten that because it just, in a, with a public building and, and needing consensus of the community, it just takes time and, and good planning. Personally, <coughs> I, I, I guess I w would want to see us move, I would want to see the board's movement a little bit over the course of the next year. Because, yeah, it might be great if, if the state would build these schools, you know, or build a new school for us and renovate the middle school and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I, I hate to see us waiting and waiting and waiting and then finding out nothing's going to happen. So now we've got to turn around because in the meantime, we will hear about those four-year-olds and three-year-olds. Right. So I think we should be under discussions myself for what makes sense and what we're, what we're thinking about should happen in the future for this. So that's where I, anyone else? I agree with that. I think ha being prepared and doing as much as we can do ahead of the DOE mm -hmm. decision mm -hmm. helps us when that decision is made to know, okay, now we know which path we're taking. Are we going the DOE route? They've approved us. We're mm -hmm. good. Or they didn't, which is sort of what we're all kind of think, or I'm at least thinking in the back of my head, that we're not going to be in the top 15 of that list. So what is that other path? And just knowing those two options so when the final word comes, we can then just move instead of starting at that Right, point. we haven't lost time. Anyone else on that? I have, I'm new to this, yes. but I, so maybe you, you all know the answer to this, but if we do get DOE funding, is there still a referendum? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. you still have to, the referendum is the legal approval to allow you to go bond public money. So no matter what you do, you have to go, even if you're 100% locally funded, you have to go to a referendum to get legal permission to borrow money to, for your right. project. One thing we should point out about the DOE funded schools, they, they fund the baseline. The, so they provide money right. to the baseline. Anything above that baseline, that, that the community must invest in those schools that are, is locally provided. So there's usually a state funded dollar and a locally funded dollar. Right. The middle school is a state funded project. The um, when it was yes, built, right? yes, exactly. Oh, we didn't Joanne hear. was saying. I'm sorry. 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 I was just saying that the st the middle school was a state funded project. And keep in mind, the middle school was too small the day it opened. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And the DOE right. knew that it was going to be too small. And so they let us add six extra classrooms, but didn't increase the size of the common spaces, like the CAF or the library or the gym, which is why our middle school students currently are in a modular, all of our sixth graders, and they eat in the hallway. 
some of them have to and eat they the go hut. to Wentworth in first. the lunch lounge I should say and also the town at that time was only willing to spend $175,000 Hmm. Okay. History. Any other comments? <laughs> Seeing none, thank you, Dan. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right before adjournment, um, let me just say um, congratulations to our new board members. We're pleased to have you join us. It was, an, it was nice to get a chance to talk to you on the phone and meet with you, Leanne. And, um, You've just finished your first meeting, so you ought to feel pretty good about the next three years now because you managed to survive this one. I think so. <laughs> oh, okay. And we have, uh, oh, okay. Kelly, Kelly provided Murphy. cupcakes. From so Kelly Murphy. Kelly Murphy, Murphy to the oh. new, new board people. Okay. Oh, <laughs> we can split them between the two of <laughs> you. And um, also, thank you for your support. Uh, I look forward to being chair again, and uh, seat feels great one more time. But <laughs> hey, Kelly, we miss you. <laughs> and Jackie, too. I know you're not feeling well. So, um, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Very good. All in favor of adjournment? S and six plus two. Very good. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you.